Okay, I'm gonna walk you guys through how we are going to actually catch different species. We, we're on our spot, we're in about 12 feet of water, we're right on that flat. I, I looked at my underwater camera, I see the weeds are here, I'm right in that trans transition, right outside of the weeds. And so how I'm going to fish it is I'm going to read my flasher on how the fish reacts because each one of these species is generally gonna need a different jigging cadence and it's going to need a little bit of different finesse when you're trying to close the deal. So what I'm going to do, if you don't have a flasher, this is gonna be kind of tough. You're just gonna have to kind of gauge the bite a little bit and jig cadences a little bit in between. You're gonna catch less fish. It's just part of the deal. If you don't have a flasher, you're gonna catch less fish. But if you do have one, what you're gonna be watching for is how the fish shows up on your sonar, and that's going to dictate how you're jigging. Bigger fish. Oh, multi-species days are my favorite. Is that a little looser? <laughs> no, dude. I'm, I got four pound test on right now. So it might be a little loose, people, but it's because I've got light test. I typically recommend six. It's just we had panfish that were a little light today. At points. Woo this might be a, I, I think it's a bigger bow, but it might be a tiger. El Tigre. You want to help me that? that is the biggest kokanee oh my that i have ever seen you guys my goodness look at that this is a landlocked salmon this is a coho that's landlocked and these things man whoo -hoo, this is a big kokanee oh my goodness look at that we've been using i've been using this chartreuse uh fire tiger combination the chartreuse um wax uh plastic and uh this fire tiger jig head and i've caught every single fish today on this i've caught bass i've caught perch i've caught bluegill i have caught uh rainbows and now this is a beautiful kokanee oh my god that's the biggest kokanee i've ever caught look at the head on that thing Oh my goodness. And this lake's known for having kind of that 10 to 12 inch kokanee, like even more like nines. And this, this is a super healthy, big kokanee. My goodness. Hoo -hoo. It's going for dinner. So let's start with perch. Perch typically come in in a big school at least three to four. And what you're going to see is you're going to see like a Christmas tree kind of light up on your flasher where there's gonna be a bunch of smaller marks that are all gonna to bundle together and it's gonna be a little hectic. Um, and so with perch, when that comes in and that happens, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift up a little bit above the group because that's going to force competition for them to come up and attack it, right? And once you drive competition in them, they're much more likely to bite. So I'm gonna go right up above it and I'm gonna jig lightly. I'm not gonna just like pitter patter, but maybe like six inch lifts and I'm gonna keep working it up. And then if I see one of them shoot up off the group, I'm gonna pause and see if he takes it. If he doesn't, I'm gonna keep working up and then I'm gonna start over again. Now, let's say you went through that whole thing and nothing took the bite, took the bait. With perch, what I like to do is I don't like to just drop it back down into that group. I want to bring it all the way up like I was because the fish missed. And then I'm gonna bring my line all the way down to the bottom. And I'm gonna sit it on the bottom and you're gonna watch that school go back down. They're typically used to feeding off of aquatics that are down in the mud in the bottom. So I'm gonna pound the bottom a couple times and then I'm gonna raise it back up. And that usually drives them crazy. 
So then I'm gonna do the same approach again and I'm gonna work it up above them and try to separate them out. In general, you want to try to fish above the perch because not only are you forcing competition and having them pull up a bit, you're also gonna sort through the smallest ones. And so giving that distance, the higher up that you jig from the group, the more likely it's going to be that you're gonna pull the biggest one out because they'll typically be the bravest and they'll separate from the group as far away um, versus the rest of them. Oh, I just missed a trout. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we we might be on to the Perch Express. Perch Express. Maybe those were the 12 fish that I saw down there on the camera. Wow, you got wrapped up in the transducer. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I just I looked down and there's a Perch Express happening right now. <laughs> What is happening right now? These are good looking perch though. Yeah, they're healthy. Yeah. They're all chunks. Chunky perch. Little guy. Oh, bigger fish, bigger mark. Oh, that's a trout, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Quite good, though. Oh my goodness, you guys. Another nice, healthy perch. My God, look at that thing. That is an eater if I've ever seen one. Ah! Thought it was a trout. Oh, I thought it was a trout. <laughs> That's a nice, healthy eater perch. Oh, just perfect tasting. I'm excited for it. Tally them up. Tally them up. We got a couple more of these bad boys. That is a good one. This one is definitely a male because right now we've gotten a bunch of females out and their bellies have just been like, uh, his belly's a little bit skinnier. Maybe it's post spawn, but I doubt it. This looks more like a male to me. Let's move in to panfish. We'll start with gills. You're gonna see a gill and you're gonna start to realize whether it's a gill or another species, it's gonna be sometimes confusing because you might get a lone perch, you might get a lone something else like a bass, um, and it's tough to tell the difference, but typically what you're gonna see with bluegill is you're gonna see one to two of them show up on your flasher. There could definitely be more down there, but they're typically gonna be off to the side in the winter, they're much slower moving. And so you're, you're typically only gonna get one to two that show up on your flasher. Um, and they're gonna just slowly come in. Um, they're gonna kind of show up. You're usually gonna get them either right off the bottom or one to two feet off the bottom. And that's when you're gonna slow everything down. Okay, and so what I'm trying to do when I get a bluegill in is I'm going to just really lightly, I can maybe jig two to three inches up but the really the go-to method with bluegill is I'm going to kind of jiggle it in place um, and pause. Jiggle it in place and pause. You still want separation, you still want a foot or two of separation, but you're trying to lead them up. And then when they get up to the bait, pause, just pause. There's a bunch of things out there, there's a bunch of techniques you can do to get to seal the deal, but listen, just, just pause. Um, and they should take it. It's gonna be a really, really light bite and oftentimes the bluegill will suck it in, spit it out, suck it in again. And so you're gonna see me do it. It's, it's a mistake that we all make where you're gonna get that first tap. Don't set the hook there. Um, wait for the tap, second tap, then set the hook. Um, but don't rip it out, okay? With the bluegills, what you're gonna to wanna to do to set the hook is just lightly raise it up because a lot of times they'll just spit it out if you give them that momentum to rip it out. 
So jiggle, 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 pause, tap, don't set it, tap again, light lift up. Then I'm just bending my rod. Um, and, and it'll typically get stuck in there. Your bluegill are tough. You're gonna have a tough time. If you really wanna focus on bluegill, I recommend investing in a bobber spring, which is on the top here. But that makes it hard to fish for all of these other types of species, um, especially like trout and all sorts of stuff. It's just gonna, it's gonna be challenging. And so you don't need to have one. Um, you're gonna see me catch a bunch of fish today without one. We're, we're gonna be fun. Um, so that's bluegill. Now, crappie will often hang out with bluegill, but crappie are a little bit tricky. Um, you're typically not gonna get them in this kind of shallower water that we're fishing in in the middle of the day. They're typically out in the basin in the middle of the day, and that's a whole nother ball game. So let's just focus on when you're gonna get crappie in this spot. They move in from the deep um, in early morning hours and late evening hours, and they come and they feed along this weed bed. And so because they're coming from this deep area where they're stratified anywhere in the water column, they can come up from the bottom, but what I often see is them coming up kind of mid-level, maybe three or four feet off the bottom, and they'll just kind of show up. They're not coming like straight off the bottom, they'll just kind of show up on your sonar, and they could be anywhere from you know two or three feet off the bottom to two or three feet below the ice. And so crappie always feed upwards, and so the moment I see that, I'm bringing my bait up above them, and instead of jigging it too much, got some ice build up here, Instead of jigging it too much, what I typically like to do is just slowly drive it up above them, see if they come, and then pause. If they don't hit, I'll jiggle it in place a little bit, and then I'll raise it up again. But again, it's kind of like bluegill. It's going to be a lighter bite. If you get into some really big ones, it's going to be more aggressive, but it's typically a lighter bite. So that's, that's how I'm seeing that it's going to be crappie, and that's kind of the jigging cadence. It's not even really jigging and how I'm sealing the deal. Okay, I think I'm marking a bluegill. The bite's so light. Ah! Oh, got him. Ugh, these fish are tough. I've missed like five of these today. This is our uh, fourth one we've caught. Uh, this is day two. Um, and we, we just ran out of battery the other days. Now, the last one we're going to do, and I mean, there's tons of species I could go over. I don't want to just like talk about every single thing on the earth. Um, so we're gonna focus on just the fish in this lake, but when the trout come in, the rainbow trout or the tiger trout, this is gonna be our last one. When they come in, you are going to see big red marks because they're moving in fast. So even if it's a smaller trout, they're typically gonna show up and they're gonna just kind of like come in if it's a bigger trout, it's gonna come in by itself. If it's a smaller trout, it's typically gonna come in in a pod of two to three. And they're just gonna show up. They can come up off the bottom, they can come up about halfway up. Um, but with trout, you're totally gonna to flip your mind around and you're gonna go really aggressive. So when they come in, your first thing to do is to start moving it up and give them a little bit of a chase. See if they come and follow it. If they follow it two to three feet up, pause it and they should hit it. If they don't, it's because they missed. If they miss, they're gonna circle around back and they're gonna come down below it. They're used to things falling down in the water. So a lot of the trout that I catch, if I don't catch them on that swift, like, oh my God, they're here, let's lift it up and pause, um, is when I drop it back down to them quickly and boom, I drop it like right below, right above their head and they typically hit it when it falls down. Um, if that doesn't happen and they miss again, I bring it down below them and then I try working it back up again, high and fast. So, okay, trout comes in, trout comes in, two to, three, two to three feet off the bottom. I'm like, let's say four feet off the bottom. I'm working it up really fast and then I'm pausing. And if they don't hit, I'm dropping it back down to where I think he's gonna be. And I'm gonna try to get it right above his snoot. Um, and I'm gonna pause like maybe half of a foot above his snoot. If he, if he hits it, great. If he doesn't hit it, dropping it back down to the bottom and then working it fast on my way up. If that doesn't happen and you have to call him back in, then I'm doing two to three foot swoops like this, boom, and dropping it back down, boom, and dropping it back down. That's the technique that you're gonna see me doing when I'm fishing for trout in general. Big swoop, drop down, big swoop, 
drop down. If a trout shows up, he'll hit it sometimes on the drop down. If he doesn't, then I'm continuing that swoop pattern. They're used to that and he's gonna come up and smash it. So, those are all the chicken. Cadence says that you should know when you're fishing for multiple species. It's gonna take a long time. Once you focus on these species individually, you're gonna understand these cadences and you're gonna understand how they show up on your flasher. And then you're gonna be able to just muscle memory adjust your jigging cadence according to what you're seeing on the flasher. Hopefully you'll get some luck and you'll be able to have like a couple um, fish come in of that same species. So if you mess it up the first time, um, you're gonna get a couple more chances and you're gonna have the ability to see how they're reacting so you can adjust yourself. All right, those are all of my instructions today. Let's start catching fish. I think we're gonna catch a lot of fish today. Oh, that is a big bow, dude. Nice. Decent one, we're keeping it? If you want to gut it. Yeah, I didn't clean any fish yesterday. I mean, I don't know, you think he's big enough? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good eating fish. <laughs> Here, show, show the kids at home that beauty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice bow. A lot of purple on the ones in here. A lot of purple. I like it. I guess better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Doesn't like that hole. No, <laughs> oh, it's just a wily trout. Nothing crazy? Nothing crazy. He's just excited. He's very excitable. But not bad. Good looking fish. Good looking fish. He's just an excitable trout. I'm gonna watch him release. 